Amen. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead and open your Bibles, if you will, to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 4. We've talked about this numerous times when Jesus came out and came to John the Baptist in the wilderness and was baptized of him. Um, <clears throat> the Bible says that the Spirit descended upon him in the shape of a uh, bodily shape as of a dove. And then goes on and gives the, here in Luke chapter 4, chapter 3, gives the lineage of Jesus. And uh, then goes into chapter 4 and says this, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned in, in, from Jordan to this wilderness, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. For 40 days and nights he was tempted of the enemy. And at, at the end of that, the he, he, Bible tells us the three things that Satan came and tempted him of, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Then it tells us that, you know, when the devil had ended that temptation, verse 13 of chapter 4, he departed from him for a season. And then verse 14 says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit in the Galilee. And there went out a fame of him round about, and they taught in the synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for it to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me. Hallelujah. Now the word anointed uh, comes from a Greek word, creo, and it's used in classical Greek, Septuagint Greek, and also in, in obviously New Testament Greek. But in, in classical Greek, it meant to smear upon or to, to, to you know, with oil, um, or even to, to apply paints or glazes. Uh, in, in some of their um, Homeric school, they use it for anointing of a person by a, a deity, which obviously wasn't referring to God, but just you know, the, the, the gods of, of, uh, of the Greeks. Uh, but the, when it got to the Septuagint, it, it obviously became more limited, became more in reference to anointing pro, uh, prophets, priests, and kings, setting forth unto their office, and, 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 and at the same time equipping them with the gifts for that office or the endowments necessary for that office. New Testament uses became even more defined, became more specific, uh, primarily to, um, to set apart and... Um, on, on the prophets, not even just, you know, not, not even just for like a, a, a natural office of a, of, a, of a king or whatever, but just, I mean, for spiritual, for spiritual purposes, became specifically designed that way. <clears throat> so, the, so to anoint means to set apart or to establish. But what is the anointing? You see, now there's a difference, you know, to anoint means, you know, they smear upon, we're being smeared upon. You know, as believers, we find out in the Word of God, we're smeared upon or, or, or covered with or anointed. As a believer, we'll get to that scripture over in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, um, or 2 Corinthians chapter 21, I think. I, I'll, yeah. Chapter 1, verse 21. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. We find that, you know, that the anointing is in us. We are anointed. Now, let's look, run right over, if you will, we'll come back here to what Jesus, you know, what he was anointed to do. Let's, we'll find out what he's anointed with. Run over to Isaiah real quick. We we'll look at Isaiah chapter 61, because the anointing is something. You know, to anoint means that we're, we're anointed with something. And what we're anointed with is found in Isaiah 61 verses, um, uh, wrong verse, hallelujah. It's in here, where, Isaiah 10, I'm sorry, I looked down at the wrong, I looked down uh, the wrong thing. Isaiah 10. Isaiah 10, 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away off of thy shoulder, his yoke off of thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now, we, now I'm, not make, I'm not the one who came up with this way of rephrasing it. You know, you heard Brother, Brother Creflo teaching a number of years ago, and Brother Copeland talking about the, the burden, the, 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 uh, the anointing, being the yoke-destroying, band-loosing, burden-removing power of God. So the anointing of God will break yokes, it will loose bands, and it will move, remove burdens from your life. The power of God will do that in your life. Now listen, the yokes that we, were, that we, we don't want to be yoked together with sin, we don't want to be yoked together with bondage, we don't want to be yoked together with uh, destruction, we do want to be yoked together with the Lord. So the anointing won't break the yoke of the Lord, but it will break the yoke of, of captivity and defeat. And things in your life that come from the enemy that are designed to pull you down and defeat you in life. God doesn't want you defeated. And so he sent his anointing to destroy yokes. Hallelujah. I mean, you might you know, you think I'm so bound up by the devil that I can't get free. I'm, I'm, I'm hooked up and he tells me to go and I go and I just follow him. Say, You're yoked with that. 
You're yoked with sin. People are yoked with pornography. People are yoked with, with uh, uh, habits. They're yoked with different things. The anointing of God will destroy that in your life. You don't have to, you don't have to go, I just can't help it. You know, I'm just bound by this. There's no way to get free. You know, it's, the, it, it's the burden removing, bond loosening, amen, or band loosening, the bands of uh, shackles and bands of defeat, the shackles and bands of sin, the shackles and bands of things that hold you back and can't, and you, where you want to you go forward with God and you want to do things for God and, and you, want, you don't want to live according to your flesh. And, you know, when you hear sermons about, you know, that don't yield your members, well, I want you to know something. You're not, you're not helpless. Now, the Word of God tells us don't yield our members as instruments. I was listening to a, a, a reading um, behind Rick Renner the other day, and he said that word instruments there in Romans where it says don't yield your members as instruments of some unrighteousness. It, says, it actually means in the Greek weapons. Don't yield your members as weapons of unrighteousness, but yield them as servants of righteousness. Make them a weapon of righteousness. Well, we want to be weapons for righteousness, don't we? But you know, don't yield yourself to weapons of unrighteousness where they hold you in captivity. They bring destruction around you. Don't let destruction be, be the path. You know, um, 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 how many know when a boat goes through the water, you know, as it's going through the water, you know, the, the, the keel is, is here and it's going forward and it's, it's, cut, it's cutting the water, so to speak. But behind it is a wake. And if, you ever, if you've ever boated at all and you go, into the, you go into where the docks are, the slips are or whatever, and you come in there, they have speed limits. And the reason is because the wakes will rock the boats. You come in there at, 50, at 40 knots or whatever, but riding your, your speedboat through the, through the harbor or through, through near the slips, and those weights go in, they'll start banging those boats up against the things and tear them up. Okay? So what do you have? You, you come through there out of control and you're just, just doing what you want to do, and you become a wake of destruction. And see, God doesn't want your life to be a wake of destruction. We're to bring peace and harmony. We're to bring life. Amen? Let, let's, let me say something. Yeah, I'm, we could be sitting here this morning going, I'm, I'm there so-and-so, I, yeah, so-and-so in the church. Well, I, I get that. You know, there's people in the churches. You're always going to have people in the churches. And the thing about the churches is you've got people in them. One guy said, man, if it weren't for the people, I would just love the ministry. <laughs> well, really, people is why you're in the ministry. And I know what they're saying is because, you know, because when people come to the table, they bring a lot of stuff. And, you know, and lots of times they don't want to do what the Word says. Uh, I was having a discussion with my son. We were talking about a situation in life and, and uh, talking about, you know, well, you know, um, <clears throat> well, the only way to fix that is to, is to, is to share what the Word of God about, says about it because you, can't, you just can't get people to do certain things. You've got to share, share the Word. And, um, and then he said, well, we ought to pray they won't get offended when the Word's preached to them. I said, well, Bob, son, the Bible says that great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall by any means offend them. If you don't love the law, you get offended. If you don't love the word, you can get offended. Especially when the, as a matter of fact, the word will offend you when you don't love the word. And, and what usually happens after that is when the, when the pastor or the minister preaches the word and you don't love it and you get offended by the word, then you get offended at the deliverer of the word, the, the one who brought the word. They got offended at Jesus. He said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And they tried to kill him. They went, they went to take him outside and throw him off a cliff. Man, pastor, if you were just like Jesus, everybody would love you. They tried to kill him and then eventually did. I'm not sure if I want to be like that. <laughs> that. You know, had the church run me up here and throw me off the, on the interstate or something. Oh, my. No, no. See, we, we've got to come to the place that we make a declaration and, a, and, a, and a, a commitment in our life that we love God's Word. And when God's Word brings instruction, when God's Word brings correction, when it brings reproof or rebuke and instruction in righteousness, we love it. You know, hit me again. <laughs> you know, how many have ever been corrected? How many loved the correction? How many knew a lot eventually you came to the conclusion it was good for me? Eh, some of you are still working on it, I see. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so, where was I when I got off on that? Hallelujah. But the, you know, we, we get bound up with stuff. We, our lives can get consumed. We, we can think our opinions about something are more important. We can think that, that, we, that, that we desire this. Or whatever. And this, this happens all the time in people's lives. It happens all the time in churches. You know, it happens in big churches. It happens in small churches. It happens in medium churches. You know, you got all kinds. Of, now, big churches, a lot of times what happens is people can hide in there because there's so many folk in there. You can just kind of hide and never, and, 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 and it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same, uh, seemingly the same effect. It's having the same effect. You know, we've got to get to the, Listen, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I, I'm talking about the anointing. Because the anointing's going to help you. I said the anointing's going to help you. You got things that, ha that have been a plague and a hound in your life. I am telling you the anointing of God will destroy that yoke and remove that burden if you'll let your trust in it and look to it. Amen? It'll remove it out of your life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But see, we've got a job to do. 
We've got a calling, not, not just faith and victory church, the church. But our church is part of that calling. We have a mission from God. And we've got to reach people. There are things we're supposed to do around the world. There are things we're supposed to do here in Greensboro. There are people we're supposed to reach. But I'm telling you, we can't do it when people get offended or people get upset or people get mad or people don't like this or people don't like that. They don't like the way the pastor did this or they don't like the way the pastor said that. They don't like, you know, they don't like the color of the carpet. They don't like this children's program. They wish they had this kind of thing. You know, I'm telling you, folks, you know, we, we, there's, 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 you're going to have that. You're not going to like it. And there's nobody in this room, I can go out here, I could walk around to everybody in this room right now and say, what is it you don't like about the church? And somebody would have something. As a matter of fact, I went to the mirror this morning and said, what do you don't like about the church? And I had three things. That was a joke, okay. <laughs> there's a couple of things. Hallelujah. I mean, I, I, I got things out of, you know, there's things about me I don't like. Amen. Hello? One thing is I wish my pants were, were, were not as big as they are. I, I lost some weight, and the dog went and put my belt up this morning in, in, the, in the office, and when I did, it broke. It broke right off. And, I, and I'm here with the belt, and my pants are going, Shh. They're, they're so big, if I don't have my belt on, they'll slide right off. Of, they'll just, that wouldn't have been good if I'd been preaching. I'm just telling you. you. You'd be going like Michael Jordan walking by and go, is there, are there boxes of briefs? You, wouldn't, you, would, you would know. And we don't need that. You don't need that image. Do what? A YouTube sensation. It would go viral. I mean, we'd be the talk of the internet world. Pastor loses pants while preaching. Well, we're not going to have that. I went and got another belt. Hallelujah. That's why I wasn't out here. I, was, I had run all the way back to the house. Glory to God. So what we have to understand is that we need to allow the anointing to work in us. We need to allow the anointing to keep us burden-free, yoke-free, and band loosed. Can you say Amen. We need to be in a place in life where we are, we're walking free from the attacks of the enemy who's trying to come in and bring division in your life, bring, bring, bring you to... Let me say something here. You know, when, when stuff starts happening to people, why am I preaching this? Because there's something going on. I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm looking around, and, and, and in church, they're, they're, this is going on with this person, this is going on with that person, and it's not just one person, it's several people. There's stuff going on, and it's attack of the enemy. Let me tell you, it's an attack of the enemy. Don't you think that, you know, that, that somehow or another that, that this thing happened to you and you're, you're upset about this? I'm telling you, something's going on. And the door's been opened somewhere, and we're shutting it this morning. Because I'm telling, see, what's, what's specifically going on, Pastor? There's stuff going on. It's a spirit. As I was sitting here this morning, I felt there, that, 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 that hindering spirit. It's a spirit. God, I heard those words, hindering spirit. That's why I prayed the way I prayed. That spirit has come to disrupt and what it will do in, in its attempt to disrupt, it's looking to call out people and separate them so he can destroy you. Because the work of God has to go forward. We were, I was talking with Jesse, and she was sharing something that somebody had told her that was, that was there at the time with a, a certain ministry. And we know what ministry is, but I'm not going to say it because publicly I don't you know <coughs> where I went to Bible school. And, and the leader came back, back a number of years ago probably about 20 or 30 years ago, there was, they, had, they had a group of musicians and singers that sang with, with their ministry. And, and after a service one night, he walked into the room after them and looked at every one of them and says, people did not get saved tonight. And people did not get healed tonight because you were ministering strife. What do you mean? There was strife in them when they went to minister from the platform. Strife came out of them. <laughs> people didn't get saved. See, we get, we, get, we get to thinking about just us. The eternity is in the balance for people. Their lives are in the balance. People didn't get saved and people didn't get healed because you were ministering strife. The minister told him one, of his, one guy one time who was working with his ministry left, came back, and when he came back, he called him into his office and said, there were things I couldn't do because you left me. End of conversation. Folks, this is, it, the, we, we got to understand spiritual things have a far greater reaching and a far greater um, influence than we realize. And so we got, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna trust the anointing. We're going to trust the yoke destroying, burden removing power of God to loose the bands, to remove the burdens, and to destroy the yokes so we can walk in the fullness of our individual calling and our corporate calling. Then we're not going to let little petty things get up and get, and get involved in our lives. <laughs> where it begins to become a distraction. I'm telling you, there's, some, there's several things that have just been going on kind of, you know, and I don't know every little thing about the specifics, but I just sense it. There's something, there's this, there's this little this rumbling, there's, this, this, there's this, this agitation, there's this, there's that. And it's, it's just kind of everywhere in the spirit. And we're cleaning house this morning. 
Not you, the Spirit. Not your life. I love you. You're wonderful. You're important. Jesus looked at Peter one day and said, Get behind me, Satan. He didn't want to talk. He didn't hate Peter. He loved Peter. But he was being influenced by the devil. He wanted that devil shut down so Peter could do what Peter was called. He said, I've prayed for you, Peter, that when you are restored, you'll strengthen the brethren. And one, and one minute he's calling them Satan. Next minute he said, I'm praying for you, though, because he loves them. See, we love you. But there's a call and a work to be done. And it's going to require us allowing the anointing to keep transforming our life, to keep us free, to keep us going with God, keep us free from those things that plague our minds. How many have ever had to deal with things coming to your head? Listen, you think you've thought about leaving the church? I have too. As the pastor, I've thought about getting like <laughs> Brother Hagin used to say this. I'm not the only one. You, said you shouldn't say that. Dad Hagin said one time, he looked over to Aretha one night and says, let's just pack up. Let's move everything out of the house. Let's drive off. And when they come to church tomorrow morning, we'll be gone. <laughs> They'll come over looking in the parsonage, knock on the door, and we won't be there. <laughs> Not tell anybody. Not tell the deacon board. Not tell anybody. Just leave in the middle of the night. See, y'all thought like dad just sat around and prayed in tongues and just walked on clouds. No. See, it's the same devil operating everywhere. He's, he's looking to call people out and to bring their life to destruction instead of, and what? To separate them from the place where the anointing of God will destroy that yoke, remove that burden, lift that band, and so they can walk free in the things of the Spirit and fulfill their destiny with God. And your destiny in this place is to be an aid and assistance to the corporate anointing so we as a corporate body can do our calling to reach humanity, to go to the world. Hallelujah. You don't know the effect that we've had in the past all over the world. Satan got mad with it and kind of shut down our finances. And, we, and we, we've let him. Well, that day, that day, that day has to be to come to a close. That, I said that day has to come to a close. We've got to, we've got to get back to where we're, we're believing God. We've got enough money to go to, go to Estonia and preach. Go, go to, i like, I got an open door to 163 Bible schools all over the world. Anywhere in the world. Go preach. Help people, help people. Yeah, but you're our pastor. Yeah, but God's also called me to go preach in those Bible schools. You know that's not on, on my life. That's part of my anointing. That's why Raymond has me overseeing the, the, the ministers I oversee. We're helping their life. We're helping minister to ministers. It's our calling. It's what we're called to do. We, not me, we. Because without you, I can't do it. Moses was stood up there <coughs> and, uh, and, and, and uh, Aaron and her had to hold his arms up. Let me say, he didn't have a leadership meeting to get them to come do it. You understand what I'm saying? They saw the need and they came and filled it. And they held his arms up. He was, he was doing what he had to do. And he became wearied in doing what he because his arms got tired. But they came and helped him. And by helping him, he was able to fulfill his task and get the job done. Amen. See, we have to run to the task. But that, birth, that, that anointing, that the anointing of God, I'm trusting it in your life. As your pastor, I'm speaking that the yokes are destroyed, the burdens are removed, and the bands are loosed in Jesus' name. That those things that have plagued you and hounded you and have come after you, we're, we're, we're speaking that the anointing of God is at our operation today to, to, to remove those things out of your life. So that you can walk in a peace. And now listen, you know this. You've got to hook up in faith on this. You've got to get involved in this. You, let, let me, well, I know. Say, I know. Hallelujah. <laughs> what do you know? I'll tell you in a minute. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What is it you know? I, I, I got to find it. Listen, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's that they used to mock Paul. Paul, you can read from Paul's letters. You can find out from Paul's letters that, that he would say something, and they would, they would basically say he was too full of himself, he was too arrogant, this, that, whatever, and then he'd write things back. Okay? You know, I, Paul, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in present, listen to this, who in presence and base among you. In other words, they, you know, base doesn't mean, it's not a compliment. 
they held him in low regard. Did you know that? He said, but being absent from you and bold toward you. But my, I beseech you that I may, be, uh, may not be bold when I'm present with the confidence wherewith I am also, I think to be bold against some which think as of us as if we walk according to the flesh. One of the things Satan does and, and brings strongholds and, and, and bondages to people's lives is, is to get them to begin to speak against the leader, the pastor, their minister, in a way so that they now no longer have respect. They, oh, he just walks in the flesh. You, you've, you've seen it. People, people come around the church and, oh, that's just Eddie and Janie, or Ed and Janie. Man, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not into titles. But when, you, when, when, when that begins to happen, what you, you're letting Satan put a stronghold on your life. This is a spirit of familiarity. So that you can, you can now be on the equal plane. Now, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're on an equal plane. In the line of, of spiritual uh, uh, authority and spiritual whatever, um, I, I'm the pastor. So there, ha so there has to be respect for the authority. There has to be respect for the position. Why? Go read your Bible. Who had the most faith in all of Israel that Jesus had never seen? The centurion. Why? He was a man under authority and had authority. His respect for authority granted him authority. Or, really, he had the authority, but his respect for authority taught him how to function in authority. Amen. You know, so Paul's sitting here saying, hey, some people think we, you know, they just got such a voice. They, they think I walk in the flesh. He said, now, though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. Yeah, I'm human. But I don't, war, I don't war in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I ain't talking about flying around in helicopters getting demons. We're talking about, what did he say? Casting down imaginations. That's in your head. These strongholds get in people's minds. They get seated into your thinking. There are attacks of the enemy. Come to thwart your ability to hear from the Spirit of the living God. And they are designed by the enemy to bring destruction to your life, to your family's life, to everything you come in contact with, so that you are now ministering out of a fleshly mindset. And you think you're walking in the Spirit. Y'all looking at me like a dog at a new pan. It is a strategy of the devil. <laughs> it is his operation. It is his modus operandi to get into your thinking and to bring a stronghold into your life, to get things in there that cause you to, to begin to reject things and begin to think things that aren't real. How many of you know this? You can make up stuff in your head and make it, so, make it up so much it seems real. Now, my mama growing up, my brother, now my mama, could, could she make a worry wart have warts. I'm just telling you. I mean, every night before I, when I'd be laying in bed, I'd hear her go through the house, and I'd hear bang, 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 bang. She put her hand on every stovetop element to make sure it wasn't on. How? I mean, it's like that's not bright. What if it's on? Well, the house didn't get burned down. Now we were in the emergency room with third degree burns on your hand because you put it on the stovetop. Remember the old round circle? You know, we got these. That she did it every night. You can just put your hand over top of them and feel if it's hot or not. If it's hot, it's hot. My, now, my brother bought a house two houses down from us. There was two houses in between us. My brother got married, moved in down just down the street, and she'd go out there and look out the street. Go out, he'd go out, they'd go out on Friday and they'd go to the clubbing. they go clubbing. Go to downtown Greenville and go to the, go to the, uh, and one honky, what, well, I can't remember the names of the clubs now. The Jolly Roger. How could I forget the Jolly Roger? Because when I was in East Carolina, I was, I mean, Travolta. <laughs> Had a lighted dance floor and everything. Because it's 76, it's, it's, it's disco era. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can tell by the way I walk. I mean, anyway, I'm a Holy Ghost man. Anyway, hallelujah. Life of God, life of God. We just we tried to get that song saved. It's just too hard. Anyway, she go out and look down the road. He won't in at eleven. He won't in at twelve. He won't at one. She couldn't go to sleep until they drove up. Oh, Bobby, he's out. He's out in a ditch somewhere. They turned the car over in a ditch. They're dead, drowning, or whatever. I mean, you know? Do we need to go? I mean, he's, he's married. 
you can get stuff in your head. Now, let me say something. That, we can worry that way. We can do that in the church. Somebody looked at you a certain way. They're thinking something about me. Somebody do something. They meant to do this. You know, and you be, where's that coming from? Come on now, where's it coming from? Who is called the accuser of the brethren? Not Jesus. Who? The devil. You see, we got it. The Bible says cast down imaginations. Why? We're to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What is Christ? Christ is Christos in the Greek, Hamashia in the Hebrew. Both words mean the same thing. They mean the anointed one. See, it's one of the, it's one of the only words we transliterated in the New Testament and made it Jesus' last name. He is not Jesus' last name, Christ. He is Jesus, the anointed one. You're to bring every thought into captivity to the anointed one. What's he anointed with? The anointing. What does the anointing do? It destroys yokes and removes burdens and loses bands. When you bring a thought into captivity to the anointed one and his anointing, it will destroy the yoke, it will loose the band, and it will remove the burden of whatever's in that thought. Why? Because those thoughts come from the enemy for one reason, to bring destruction. They'll bring it to your life, and they'll bring it to others around you. Come on now. And we've all seen it happen. I said we've all seen it happen. I've seen people go and, and follow after those thoughts. We had one friend that, that was in our church at one time, and he came to me. <coughs> he went off to a conference. Came back. Oh, they had to meet with me. Had to meet with me. Sit down. Start talking about this meeting. They talked about how the, you know, the, uh, the mustard tree had a lot of branches and the birds would come and lodge in it. They were demon spirits. It was all a bunch of weird stuff. But then, then the other thing he got, the Holy Spirit's not a person. It's not yet because Romans says the Spirit itself helped with our infirmities. Holy Spirit's not a person. <clears throat> and started sharing all, started talking all this stuff. I said, look, and I started sharing scripture and, and he, didn't, he didn't accept what I said. I said, oh, here's the deal. You know, we're going we're gonna to leave here today. We, we, you don't agree with me, I'm, and, you know, and so forth. So I said, but don't you share this with anybody in the church. I got a phone call three hours later. Pastor Ed, so-and-so just came by and told me all this. Really? You think, I just got done telling them. See, they had come into our church, got born again, got filled with the Holy Ghost. But they got over there and some thought got in. Got in and got into their got into their, 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 the arena of their soul of, let me say, pride's a danger. You know, pride goes before destruction, the Holy Spirit before the fall. Got settled into that because they thought they knew something that the pastor didn't know. And when I brought, tried to bring correction, remember, the great peace have they that love thy law, but nothing shall in any, in any, any means offend them. And when I brought the word, what happened? They didn't love the law. They loved their revelation above the word. And they started sharing that all over the church. That's so how I started teaching. Why? Because the only way you're going to correct it is to teach. Did about a 20, 20 sermon series on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. First thing was, he's a person. Just, I mean, we went through R.A. Torrey's book, Person and Work of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have it, I don't know if it's still in print or not, you need it. Find it from an old used place or something. R.A. Torrey, Old Assembly of God guy, the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Tremendous revelation in there about the Holy Spirit. Well, Obviously, they, then they got, he got madder and madder. The more I taught him, the more he got madder he got. Left. Wasn't long after that, he, he went and gave people all of his Hagen books. Just kind of just completely fell out, left, left God and left everything. Didn't want anything to do with any of it. One minute, it's helping them change your life. Oh, man, those teachers changed my life. Next minute, don't want anything to do with it. What happened? Satan got into that seed in the mind. Instead of then casting down that imagination and bringing it into captivity to what? The anointed one and his anointing. Now, every thought. Why? Because if that thought can be brought to the anointing when his anointing and it stand the test, it's of God. His, his purginess, he, he'll purge that. He'll cleanse that. And if it's of God, it'll, 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 it'll stand. If it's not, it's going to get eat up. Now, you can lay hold of it if you want to, but it'll bring destruction to your life. Amen. 
had one guy in our church at one time. And I said, these, these are people from way back. I'm just, I'm, you know, you wouldn't know them. They walked in right now, you wouldn't know, and I wouldn't tell you it was them. But every time somebody in our church would see this guy somewhere outside, he'd go, hey, so-and-so, look good to see you. Now that pastor, he started in on me. I mean, just going nuts on, on Pastor Ed. Actually, I don't know if he called me Ed. I think he called me Ed, Ed Taylor. He didn't even call me Pastor. I mean, he just went off. What happened? Well, one thing was I was telling him living with his girlfriend won't write. People get mad when you tell them they can't have sex. Outside of marriage. They'll tell you, I'm under grace, or it's okay. God, the Lord showed me it's all right. Oh, really? I mean, the same one that said, you know, that they that fornicate had no part in the kingdom of God? You know, he told you it was okay to go ahead and do it? No. See, when, when we don't let the anointing work in our life and keep our lives clean, destroy yokes and remove burdens, when we begin to reject, you can't reject the anointing. Because Jesus is the anointed one, and he's anointed with the Holy Ghost. And the anointing of God destroys yokes and removes burdens. You can't reject him, or you're going to open yourself up to your own ways and your own thoughts. Let's go over to John first. Time. I am so far away from my notes. I may try to come back tonight and jump on my notes, but I don't know if it's going to work. Hallelujah. First John, chapter 2. You know this passage of Scripture. Let's, let's, let's um, run, look at verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perpetuation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the whole world. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, he didn't say if you're born of him, you know him. I can tell you, you can be, you can be born of God and not know God. You can walk according to the flesh. But if you keep, listen, I know there's people running around saying that you, you, know, you don't have to do anything. You know, you're free. You can do anything you want to. It doesn't matter. You're in the grace. The Bible says if you know God, you keep his commandments. You do what God wants you to do. If you know God, you keep his commandments. Hallelujah. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the, and, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, whoo, verily is the love of God perfected or matured. Hereby know that we are in him. He that saith that he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Now stop there. <clears throat> he that keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. What did we, say? we quote to you earlier? Great peace have they that love thy law. Nothing shall by any means offend them. See, when you walk in that place of keeping God's word, because you love God, you love his word, you see, then you're maturing the love of God. Not perfect. You see, the word, we, we, anytime you see perfect um, in, in the King James Bible, in reference to you as a person, it really means mature. It doesn't mean flawless. It means mature. Okay? So we have to understand, you know, he, uh, he, the, um, he that keeps his word of him is, love, is the love of God matured. You have a mature stance, a mature understanding of the love of God. Hereby know we that we, we're in him. He that saith he abideth in him also, also so to walk even as he walked. Now, folks, this is the first sermon I ever preached was 1 John 2, 5. He that saith he to abide in him, also so to walk, even as he walked. Let me tell you something. It's time we start acting like Jesus. Not because we're trying to <clears throat> work up an imitation of him, but because we love his law. We love his word. We keep his word. We do his word. And when our flesh rises up, we look to the word. Well, what's the word? The word is Jesus. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Ghost. The anointing of God destroys yokes and removes burdens. When you're doing the word, you're releasing the anointing in your life. You're releasing it to destroy the... Listen. Romans chapter 12. We taught on this numerous times. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. What does it mean? We've said this before. The word conform means to be shaped according to the world. Don't act like the world. But be transformed. Greek, metamorpho, metamorphosis. Experience a metamorphosis. How? The renewing of your mind. What's taking place in the mind? You're allowing the anointed word to destroy the yoke and remove the burdens of the things and the thoughts that will bring you into a place of destruction if you don't watch it, if you don't guard yourself, if you don't put a guard over your mind. Put on the helmet of salvation. Amen? Now, salvation is soterius, comes out of the Greek sozo. Now, out of the noun sozo. Okay? 
We, we, have, we have those, we, well, actually salvation is the noun, Greek, the sozo is the Greek verb. Soterius is of the sozo word group. Okay? To, 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 to make sound, to keep whole, to heal, to save. Amen? Put on the helmet of salvation, Ephesians 6 says. Put on the helmet of, of wholeness. See, that word of God, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come all over the place right now. That helmet of salvation is in reference to the word of God, the anointed word, the part you don't like word. Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. Love your brother. Do good to them that despitefully use you. Now, not didn't just absolutely not know what they were doing. Despitefully used you. Flat out, straight up, deliberately did it. The Bible says do good to them. Ow! Oh, Lord! That, that was hard. You ain't kidding that's hard. How many got flesh? That was not a trick question. How many have flesh? Okay. If you don't, you're not here. And we ain't supposed to be seeing you. All right? If you're, if you're here and don't have flesh and we see you, you, are, you, you come out! <laughs> Hallelujah. Boy, I'm telling you right now, who wants to slap somebody that's done wrong to them? Go ahead and raise your hand. Do good to them that despitefully use you. Maliciously, on purpose. Ow, Lord, that ain't right. You better cast that down. I said, you better cast that down. I said, you better cast that down. Why? Because Satan's looking for a foothold in your life. And if you're not bringing that into captivity to the obedience of the anointed one and his anointing, it's looking to put, and it's to get engrafted. Do you remember this? What was it? Receive you with meekness, the engrafted word was able to do what? Save, sozo. So, you know, we talk about the helmet of salvation, soterius. Out of the sozo word group, you know, receive with meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save sozo, your soul, not your spirit. James is writing to believers. Your suke, the soul, the mind. Satan is looking for a foothold in your thinking. And the place he starts is the same place that Israel started. Y'all remember that, don't you? Went real well for Miriam. Remember that? They weren't happy with how Moses was running stuff. They got together and started having a little conference on the slide, her and Aaron. Well, I'll tell you what, the Lord speaks to us just like he speaks to Moses, and God showed up. I, tell you, I think we need a little more God showing up every once in a while around the church. He says, I speak to you, but I speak face to face with Moses. Bam! You'll have leprosy be put out of the camp, and Moses had to go intercede for her. Well, I tell you, we'd straight up the church would hurry if we did stuff like that today. Wouldn't it? What was it? It wasn't that Moses was perfect. It wasn't that Moses was, was, was the best leader on the planet. He wasn't. He was a horrible leader. If you live from leadership, tech, teachings, and principles, Moses, Moses wasn't any good. He just followed God because he loved God. He was, he was the instrument God called. And when they started basically complaining about how, I guess, his leadership skills or how he was running stuff, and they said, well, we talked to God too. That's never the question. But the attitude behind that is, why do you think pastors, pastors reach up and split churches all the time? Because they think God talks to them just like they talk to the pastor. That was that God, God didn't even, you know, God said, look, I, 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 I talked to you. But Moses and me, we talk face to face. He's the, he's the one I put in charge. He's anointed to do that. You're, that. you're letting the spirit into your life that's going to bring you to misery and destruction and cause a wake of destruction to follow your life. And I know, I know people in this church. I know you. In, in, in any of your flaws, and any of your shortcomings, and we all have including myself. You all right, Jeff? Yeah, she, said, he got getting, she over there scratching his back, his eyes rolling back in his head. 
Think I'm going to go catch him before he falls out. Now, Janie, come over and get mine. I got it. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know your life. I know you. I know, I know beyond whatever you're going through or dealing with. And I know down in the deepest of your hearts, you want to do the right thing and you want to follow God and you want to be a blessing. But see, Satan's been working and working on people in the church trying to call them out and trying to separate them and trying to get them over here and trying to get them over there and trying to do stuff in their life here and try to bring these thoughts there and trying to bring those thoughts there. And not just one person or two people, several people at the same time. Right at the, at the same time. Why? Because that's how mean he is. Because what's he after? He's after something. He's after the anointing that we bring as a corporate body that's going to bless people in the world. He's after that thing. If he can shut that down, I mean, he may not stop the whole body of Christ, but he'll stop our effect in reaching people all over the world that we are called to do. He's after that. And he can't come straight up. If I hadn't quit yet, I ain't going to quit. So what's he doing? If I can't, look, just like the communist 40, 50 years ago said, we will never destroy America from the outside. We'll destroy it from the inside. We'll, we'll, we'll pick away and we'll chip away and we'll bring socialistic this and socialistic that and, and socialist ideas here, 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 all the way underneath. <clears throat> and we'll dumb down the society. We'll te- we won't let the kids learn anything in school. We'll dumb them down. We'll pass them when they can't read. We'll pass them when they can't, they can't do their math. We'll move them forward. And, we'll, and then, we'll, then we'll, put the news, we'll get all the newscasters and all the media to, to support socialist agendas and report that and become commentators instead of news reporters. And we'll bring America to the brink of destruction from within to where the Constitution falls and falls apart. And that's been their plan for decade after decade after decade to fill the courts with liberal judges. We've got people in the Supreme Court right now who say, that they believe they can look at international law to interpret our laws. And that's, that's hogwash. They were sworn in to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. Not what the French judge says. I don't care what the French judge says. I don't care what the Hague says. That's the international court. I don't care. What any, we are to live by the Constitution of the United States of America. But see, what are they doing? They're working from the inside. Satan can't stop us from the outside. So what's he do? He tries to call one off here, pull one off there, work here, bring dissatisfaction, bring discontentment, bring something to the minds of people where they begin to, be, and, and, and they lay hold of it, <clears throat> and suddenly their, their, their mind is, is engrafted with thoughts. And this is going on, church, in our midst. I'm finding out, you know, several things in the past uh, recently. Different people are just dealing with different stuff. Let me say this. I love you. I'm for you. I believe in your heart of hearts you want to do the right things. That's why I'm preaching when I'm preaching. I could just let you go by the wayside and say, oh, tough. Let them, you know, if you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. I want to save you. I want to restore you. I want to bring you out of that place of defeat and darkness into the place of his glorious light. I want to see the word of God work in you and make you integral in fulfilling the, the calling of faith and victory church. I want you to be people who are ready to run up and hold my hands without me having to say, I need you to do it. You just come do it. Without getting the big head, I helped hold his hands up. You know, you're not holding the hands of the pastor. You're holding the hands up of the anointing. The calling. Why we're here. Our purpose. Our destiny. And man, did I have no clue I was going this direction this morning. I had a whole other direction I was going. We were talking about you personally. Oh, you're going to be free. Hallelujah. I, thought, I was, I, I was going to preach. Hallelujah. They're going to be running. Talking about how free they're going to get. Let me say, your freedom is tied to this church. Your life is tied to this church. Your calling and commitments and destiny are called tied to this church. Because it's not we being many are one body. You have a purpose and a place here. <coughs> Hallelujah. Well, I can go to such and such church. They're, they're cool. They might be cool, but they're not your calling. Amen. Hello. Father, we speak life this morning. 
We make a declaration. The anointing of God's working. I believe. I believe. I believe. There's, a, there's something taking place in people right now. In your hearts <coughs> that now goes into the effect of what you're thinking that where the enemy can I say something when God look at me when God begins to deal with you and the word begins to deal with you sometimes it's just good to throw it all on the table and say yes Lord I repent I change and not have any buts with it I did I tried that with the Lord once it didn't work Number, you know, a number of years ago, we had the pastor came in here. And, well, pastor, the guy came in here. He kind of stirred up a bunch of mess in the church. And I got mad with him. I'm going to tell you, if I spent a year out of love, I'd go to a meeting. He'd walk up and grab me and say, I love you, brother. I'm thinking, if you love me, you wouldn't have done what you'd done to me. And, I, and I'm telling you, I'd get so mad, I'd turn around. I'd want to hit him. You can't, you can't understand the, the, the self-control it took not to knock him out. Brother Hagin was over at, at J.C. Hash's church one time. This was not, not in 2003, years before that. He's over there preaching. I'm over there going, here, Brother Hagin. Here comes this guy. I love you, brother. And I'm thinking, Raymond, Raymond pastor knocks out another pastor at Hagin meeting. Beats him. Front, I mean, that's how I felt. I wanted, I wanted, you know, I just thought, you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What, what, you know, I can repent later. I want to hit him. It's kind of vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And I'm thinking, Lord, I got it. Just let me, this one's mine. <laughs> Go take care of Copeland. I got it. I wanted to. Oh, I wanted to. And he didn't help. Walking up, grabbing you and saying, I love you. And you know he's lying like a hound dog on a hot summer afternoon on the front porch. You know, hound dogs are lazy anyway. You get them on a hot day out on the front porch and they're lazier. And we're at, so we go to camp meeting. And here he is. Walk around with his wife behind him and his worship leader. She's about to die of insulin. And he's walking around with her. He's walking with the worship leader. Telling people he's got a special anointing with his worship leader. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> he has special anointing. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, we'll leave that one alone. <laughs> and he come by and we, I love you, brother. I'm thinking you. Well, Dad Hagen did something that year. He didn't, he didn't normally preach on the afternoons. That year he preached in the afternoon, preached on walking in love. I still had the bruises to, repro- to prove it. We mean bruises to prove he preached on walking in love because my wife was going, wham! What are you going to do about that? Wham! I mean the whole service, just elbowing me right in there. Just, what are you going to do about that? And the more he preached, let me say something. The matter I got. Why have I got to go and forgive him and take care of this when what he did to me and did to my life and did to our church, why have I got to repent and and forgive him? He hadn't asked me to forgive him. All he's done is run around and send checks in the mail and try to buy my forgiveness. I'm I'm sitting there, I mean, all those thoughts are going through my head. That's a long, I'm younger then, you know. That proves I got what? Flesh! And I'm sitting there going, I know he's right. Dad's talking about just forgive him. You know, he, he goes on preaching on love and forgiveness and the way he does. And when he gets done, there's no way out. I mean, he's wrapped you up, tied you up, and tangled you all up with the Word so much, there is no out except do what the Word says. So we get up, walk out of, out of there, walk, start walking back to the hotel. We're, down, we're staying downtown at the high-rise of the Williams Center. And it's, about, it's about a four-block walk from the assembly center. It's 110 degrees of Tulsa. A lot of times summers are 105 to 115. That's just That's normal. So we're walking down the sidewalk there. Janie's got her shoes off in her hands because the high heels are hurting her heels. And she's got my hand. And, she, and, she, and my wife is sneaky. She doesn't have them long fingernails by mistake. There's a purpose in them. Nathan knows about that purpose. It's, it, when he was younger, it was the neck. The claw. Or the forearm. Or the back of the hand. I'm just going to tell off my wife. You'll be sitting in a restaurant and running your mouth too much. All of a sudden, she'll grab your hand. And just gently lay her fingernails up on top of you and then start going. Mm. <laughs> and then the dumb husband goes, What, honey? 
So she's got my hand and digging the claw in. What you going to do with it? I mean, oh, we're back to the hotel. Get in the room. I'm trying to lay down and take a nap to get over this. Because I'm still mad. None of y'all ever been here, have you? I'm mad that he did me, that pastor did me wrong. I'm mad that it hurt our church. I'm mad that Dad Hagen, now my spiritual father, my spiritual, you know, my spiritual father has told me I gotta walk in love and forgiveness. Instead of saying you're right, you got a right to feel like the way you feel, he done you wrong and you 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 he needs to get his come That Ain't what he said. I had to forgive him. See? Now let me say something. So we lay down. You think my wife stopped talking? No. Reaches over there. What you going to do? And finally, because I wanted some rest, I said, I guess I'm going to forgive him. Okay. And she lays over there. I'm laying over there, and I'm, just, I'm sitting there. I mean, you're just kind of visualizing. Your, I know what I got to do. I just won't do do it. And finally, I say, all right, Lord. I forgive him. I forgive him for hurting our church. I forgive him for the things he did to us personally. I forgive him for the pain we went through. I release him in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless his life. I mean, didn't do this. That, that was hard, too. I mean, I almost choke on the words. <laughs> then I went to sleep. Went the next day, we walked through the assembly center. And here comes somebody from behind and grabs me. Love you, brother! And I turn around and guess who it is? <laughs> didn't get it. I mean, like, it's, like, it's like God's going to make sure you didn't have a long time to... to to find out whether you have really have or hadn't. And I turned around, and I'm telling you, for the first time in over a year, no anger, no desire to hit him, choke him, throw him over the balcony, anything like that. Thoughts go through your head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How does this feel? <laughs> so you're a pastor. You can't feel that way. You've got flesh. You can feel some ways. But I'm telling you, for the first time in over a year, the anger was gone. The desire to inflict bodily injury in huge amounts was gone. I was free. What happened? The anointing, when I, when I accepted the word and I allowed the word to come in, the anointing broke that yoke and lifted that burden, removed that banned from my life. And I was free. I said, I was free. Now, there's more to the story that, of, of what ended up happening, but, you know, with him personally, but, you know, not me. I was free. His wife came to us. We saw her one day, and her and her husband ended up being divorced, but she, we saw her somewhere, and she came to us and just repented and said, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know what had gone on. I'm sorry. I said, we'd already forgiven we didn't have to think, you know, well, we, we, we do forgive you. You know, we love you. You know? But it was some time later. You know, um, somebody, somebody came to me, uh, called me a few years ago. Him and his wife divorced. But he called me and said, Pastor Ed, he said, I love you. I'm sorry. I, I, forgive me. Brother, we, we forgave you a long time ago. Because, see, I got free. I got free. What, was, what would Satan have done if I had not forgiven and rejected the word of God at that point in time? He would have destroyed my ministry. He would have destroyed the church. He would have destroyed me. He could have destroyed my family. My kids could be living somewhere, my wife somewhere else, and me somewhere else, and just, you know, hope I just, it's all messed up. I don't want to be messed up. I, want, I, I love my family. Now mess with them. I'll hurt you. Now, I'm sorry. I will lay hands on you. Hard, fast, and continuously. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm, well, I am not teasing about that. Anyway, I said that to say this. If we let Satan get a root in our life, he'll drive us to the wrong place. 
And we have to have the anointing of God to keep us free. Yeah, when that's, the word is anointed. The Holy Ghost comes on us. We need to keep every thought in captivity to the obedience of Christ so we can stay free. Our life has to stay free. Because you can get caught up in a hurry, and you can get bound up in a hurry, and you can get consumed in a hurry by the enemy. I had somebody tell me one time, well, the de God showed me I don't have to be the devil's doormat. Now, listen, if you're, let me say this. If you're in a place where you've got a husband who beats you, you don't have to stay there. That's, that's not Bible. If you're in a place that somebody is, 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 is a, it's a constant verbal abuse where you're called all kinds of names every time you're around, you're no good, you're, that's, that, that, you, don't have to, you don't have to stay in that. That's, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay? Matter of fact, those, are, those things are unhealthy. And if you do that to your spouse or to your loved ones, you need to let the anointing break that mess out of your life because you're wrong. Amen? God called your wife to be your help meet, not your dog. Amen? But a lot of times people say, I don't have to be the devil's doormat. It's just an excuse to not have to walk in love. Now, we've got to walk in love. The anointing of God. Remember this? The great peace have they that love thy law. Nothing shall make me offend them. Offend, 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 offend. When you walk in love, when you walk according to the word, you love his word, you're not going to get offended by the word and doing the word. Now, your flesh ain't going to like it. How many, how many know that? Some of you, how many this morning, no, don't raise your hand. Just ask yourself. How many this morning I was preaching new things in your life that you need to deal with, you didn't want to deal with, it, hadn't been wanting to deal with, and, ha and had made up an excuse why you didn't have to deal with it and didn't like what I said, but you know you got to do it. I didn't say anybody. I said, not raise your hand. Because I, I, you know, word's working. The anointing's working. It'll bring freedom to your life. I said, it'll bring freedom to your life. And there's people here that should, that should have been here today that weren't here that needed to hear this, but that's okay. You got it. I tell you, you get, listen, we're going to minister life. We're not going to minister strife. Life's going to flow out of us. No more wakes of destruction. Amen? Somebody say amen. amen. All right, say Shandai. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you that you brought him to bring correction to our lives, to bring instruction to our lives, to bring us to, listen, bring a place to a freedom. You know, the Bible says that no man loves chastening at the moment. But you know what God's word also says? That if the Lord doesn't chasten us, we're bastards. That's what the Bible says. So when correction comes from the word, we should, we should be glad because we're his children and not bastards. That's, that's Bible. That's what the Bible says. We know that means illegitimate. You're not illegitimate children of God. We're children of God. And he chastens those he loves. And so if correction comes through the word, that means God loves us. It's his love for you that does it. Let me say, as his pastor, as his under-shepherd, when I bring correction through the word, through the preaching of the word, it's because I love you. Why? Because that correction brings a safety to your life and a, and a protection to your life. Amen. Bless them, Lord. Help them. Help each one to take hold of this and, and, and judge areas in their own life. They have not submitted thoughts and, and things to the, to the anointing. Have not yielded it to Christ, the anointed one. When his yoke destroying, burden removing power. That you will work in their lives. And by breaking those things out of that thought life, through your anointing, liberty and freedom comes. Restoration to their purpose and calling comes. In Jesus' name. Amen.